All right, welcome back everybody. We are on lecture number two for unit three. Uh, we're starting with more colonial protests. We went over last time all the different things that the colonists were doing to show their uh, kind of displeasure with the king, and we talked about that with the King's m, &M simulation the other day. Uh, this keeps going. The more taxes and acts that are happening, the more oh. anger that the colonists have for the king. So if you look at, again, they believe the taxes and acts were against their natural rights. Now this is a very important concept right up here. The natural rights, they go back to an Enlightenment figure by the name of John Locke, and that Enlightenment figure, John Locke, a writer for England, wrote down that people were guaranteed their natural or basic rights as people, and that any king or leader that did not grant them, you could rebel against. And his three natural rights were, if you said the rights to life, liberty, and property, you are exactly a winner, so golf clap for you. Um, Major cities in the colonies, cities like Philadelphia, cities like uh, Charleston in South Carolina, Boston, are beginning to boycott British goods or refuse to buy them in their minds. If they don't buy anything from the king, the king is losing money on them. Uh, so that's a big thing as well as smuggling or boycotting. That's them showing, you know, with just the power of money, how we can hurt you. Uh, you have men like Sam Adams who uh, continue to write letters and lead a group called the Sons of Liberty. So Sam Adams was one of the guys who created the Sons of Liberty, and he's writing to all of his friends, friends from across the colonies, guys like Ben Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, keeping them updated. They're kind of like pen pals, and they write and continue to come up with ideas of how they can get to the king and kind of you know make him upset, kind of like you and your brothers or sisters. If you are upset or angry with your parents, and then you try to almost like plot together to get back at them for certain things. Uh, He's known as a propagandist, and this is somebody that always tries to keep things stirred up. So he's trying to find ways to get the king really mad at him. He almost, like, finds entertainment that the king hates him so much. So he puts out different writings. He puts out different things for newspapers or pictures to make people think certain ways. Uh, one of those things that he does happens on March 5th of 1770 over in Boston. Outside of a custom house, which is where you paid your taxes, a red coat guard is stationed there and he calls for help. He actually calls for help saying that there were a group of angry rioters on their way. And going back in time a little bit, to prior to this, this night of March 5th, a group or a couple soldiers that were in the area. Now soldiers lived in the area that they were stationed at. So these soldiers usually to make more money would go out and look for odd jobs. Uh, two of the redcoat soldiers, while trying to find something they could do to make extra money, stopped at a rope making place, a rope making store, and the men noticing them as being soldiers in the area, they actually got into a fight. So the two soldiers were beat up by the members of the rope walk or members that worked at the rope walk. So going back to March 5th, the captain or leader of the army that's stationed at this custom house, his name is Captain Thomas Preston, and with eight other soldiers, nine total, they are stationed at this custom house or tax house to stop the, pro the, the rioters, the protesters. So according to rumor and different people that were there, the crowd, the rioters, were throwing snowballs. Now, because of the time in March, it was snowy, but these snowballs were packed with chunks of brick or anything else they could find, ice, and they were throwing them as hard as they could, literally just a few feet away, at the nine soldiers with their guns drawn. And their captain, Captain Preston, orders the men to load their muskets, and basically what happens next is just, we know through just the different witnesses who we wrote down what happened, and basically in the course of a couple minutes, there was a lot of fighting and just gunshots rang out. So you have these eight men with their muskets loaded starting the fire. One or two shots total, that's all. And at the end when the smoke clears after just a few minutes of fighting, five people are killed and six are wounded. Now when you hear the words Boston Massacre, you totally don't think that just five, five killed and six wounded would be a massacre. But it is called that based on something else that happens. And uh, just as a history, little kind of tidbit, if you look into the Kent State shootings at Kent State University on May 4th of, of 1970, the same exact story is basically there, that you have armed guards getting things thrown at them, and they fire their guns as well. So if you look, when the trials all take place, a guy named Sam Adams is going to go on trial or go to, you know, go in this case, you have the cousin of Sam, John Adams, who's going to be the lawyer hired for the soldiers. So John Adams, who's going to be the guy that's going to try to get the soldiers to be found not guilty. 
So he loses his kind of popularity, John Adams does, because he's stepping up for the soldiers. He's actually defending the soldiers who killed five people. And his reasoning is that he believes in a fair trial for everyone. It's his job as a lawyer to do that. Now, here is a painting by two men, a man named Paul Revere, who you'll hear about later in the unit, and a man named Sam Adams, who you know about. And if you look at the painting, this painting represents the Boston Massacre in their eyes. And they say that, of course, they were there as witnesses, and they saw this happen. So if you look at the painting, you notice that there are the Redcoats stationed in their straight lines with their muskets drawn. There's Captain Preston giving the order to fire, and you see the Redcoats all firing in straight lines at people, and you see innocent people getting shot at and falling down. Now, this was a way of propaganda for, for Sam Adams. Sam Adams hates the king. He wants the colonists to break away as much as possible. And he makes this, you know, he creates this painting with Paul Revere, which then this painting goes into the newspapers the next day. This painting goes into all around to different colonies and cities so that the rest of the world and colonies can see how evil the Redcoat soldiers are. So this is the Sons of Liberty version, which is a form of propaganda. This is the same picture or same scene as told through the eyes of the witnesses who were there. So in this case, you see these soldiers kind of not exactly firing all at the same time. Their guns are up. Their guns are pointed somewhere else. You have a couple men firing into the crowd. And then you have the crowd or angry group that's rioting. They look like the ones that are actually fighting the Redcoats. They're the ones that are the aggressors. And you have the colonists, or in this case, you have the Redcoats, sorry. The Redcoats are actually using self-defense. All right, so when the trial started, you have the captain's trials first, Captain Preston's. Uh, it's the longest trial in the history of basically the colonies at the time. It lasts over a week. 96 different people testify against the captain, saying that they saw him order the men to fire, They that he was basically the man that told them all to fire their guns and kill these innocent people, and it's his fault. And John Adams, his lawyer, actually calls witnesses who then say, and again, just like you know, a principal or vice principal at a school, you call all the witnesses you can to see which stories or which versions of the story are true. Everybody sees something different. It's like the game telephone. Uh, everybody sees a different version of it, and then it's a matter of sitting down to get the facts out of those different stories. So when they do call a couple of the witnesses in, a couple of witnesses said that they were just four to five feet away from the captain and that he never ordered them to fire. But he did order them to load their weapons and, and point their muskets out but he never ordered them to fire. And basically what else came out was that a few of those snowballs hit the men with their guns drawn and automatically the men, almost in self-defense, started firing their guns. And as soon as they fired once, most of the men just put their guns down and refused to keep firing or loading their weapons. Now when this information went out, the jury met and decided that Captain Preston was not guilty which of course angered all the colonists. The colonists wanted this man put in jail or killed for the fact that five of their colonists were killed. So the next trial then was for the eight soldiers who were the ones that were basically put on trial for murder of those five people if they fired the guns. And again, John Adams defends them saying that these are great men, these soldiers who are good people. They were upstanding citizens. They were the ones in the city trying to get jobs and help out. Uh, they wrote down that these two men, or he explained that these two men, Hugh Montgomery and Matt Kilroy, who were two of the soldiers, were the ones that actually, if you go back to the painting from before, those are the two men right over here with their guns drawn shooting directly at people. And what had happened was during the trial we found out that these two men were going after the people who had beat them up at the rope walk before, that these were the two men who were beat up by the colonists in the rope store. And when they noticed those same men in this riot, that they shot them and then went after them and stabbed them with bayonets. So these, again, the man right here, Matt Kilroy, was seen stabbing Sam Gray, the owner of the rope walk. And again, John Adams has a big thing to fight. He's got these other six men, at least, who look like they were using self-defense. His argument is that the people that were shot, the rioters, that they were troublemakers. They were drunks of the colony. You know, these are just bad people. They don't really help Boston at all. That these are a bunch of drunk people who had come from bars and they were going to the custom house to burn it down. These are just like angry. They're like felons. And basically John Adams' argument was not that their death was a good thing, but look, they caused this on themselves. You know, they, they were the ones to start the riot. They were the ones to throw the, you know, bricks with the ice around it at the men who had guns drawn. And, you know, it was self-defense. So when the jury met...
you have the jury finding the six soldiers not guilty of anything. And then these two men, Hugh Montgomery and Matt Kilroy, were found guilty of manslaughter, not murder, but manslaughter. And their punishment was their thumbs were branded or burnt with an M on them. And they were sent home to England, which honestly, if you think about it, was actually not a punishment, but actually a good thing. It's kind of like being suspended from school. If you're home without parents and anything else, that's great. And these men were actually sent back to their homes to live the rest of their lives. And they were almost considered heroes back in, in England that they killed these angry, you know, rioting colonists. All right, moving on to the last informational slide. You have the Tea Act, another new act sent by the king. Oh. And you have the, the, the Tea Act is basically something where the king, again, is needing as much money as possible. How can he make money off these colonists to pay for that French and Indian War? And the king owns one of the largest tea companies in the world. It's called the British East India Tea Company. And he is going to not tax his own tea. So, again, the colonists drank tea like it was their job. That's what they wanted to drink. It was that. It was pretty easy to get. Uh, it was something, again, though, they could not make. They had to import. And the king offered the cheapest tea. So the king's tea, the British East India's tea, was the cheapest tea. The king actually was pretty smart with this and decided he was going to tax all the other teas. So everybody else's tea was super expensive. Whereas his company's tea, the British East India one, was the cheapest. So colonists would have to buy his tea, which makes him money directly. Whereas if the colonists bought the other teas because they hated the king, they were still paying a tax for the king. So either way, the king, being a pretty smart guy, the king was making tax money off those colonists. So the people of America are not very happy. They looked at this as a monopoly, basically saying that the king's tea is the only one they can afford to pay, but they hated the king so much they didn't want to, but they needed to buy tea, they wanted to buy tea, and they bought his tea. Basically, he made it so that his tea was the only affordable one, kind of like if you go to the gas stations in Mentor, Ohio, if one gas station was selling gas for $2 a gallon and everybody else was 5 the $2 gallon place would sell the most, and the other gas stations would say that's unfair, that that would be creating a monopoly on gas or oil, which would be true. Um, last but not least, you have the Committees of Correspondence. These are men, mostly the Sons of Liberty and other upstanding citizens in the colonies, who would write letters back and forth, kind of like old school pen pals. And what they would do is they would write about how unfair the British were being in their colonies. So you have men like Sam Adams from Boston writing to Ben Franklin in Philadelphia, writing to Thomas Jefferson in Virginia and George Washington. And these men would all stay in contact with one another asking, like, what's the new news? It would be kind of like your friends, if your friends go to a men or football game on Friday night and you're not there and they're texting you what's happening to keep you up to date. Same idea here. These men are, are almost texting each other back then, different things that are happening where the British are being more unfair to them. And last but not least, in Boston, this is the city and colony of Massachusetts where it's really struggling to break away and really causing the king the most problems. On December 16th, 1773, in response to this tea act where the king is almost creating a monopoly of his tea, a group of, so we'll say, Mohawk Indians, they're actually Son of Liberty members dressed up like Mohawk Indians, you see their paintings down here, uh, go on board a few shipments of tea from the king. And when they get on board these boats, they capture the men on board the boats, tie them up, and they proceed to dump 342 chests of tea leaves, or 50,000 pounds of tea leaves, into Boston Harbor. It is the largest um, brewing of tea of all time, so good for them. But the unfortunate thing is that they put the tea into salt water, so it ruins the tea and costs the king pretty much thousands and almost millions of dollars back then. And the Tea Party, again, is a show of anger that the colonists have split feelings, whether you're a loyalist or you're a patriot calling for independence, that this is coming. It's really splitting the lines now where you have people that are for the king, for what he's trying to do, and you have people totally against the king wanting to break away like the Sons of Liberty or like Sam Adams. So I leave you with the picture of the day. There, again, is the big celebration called the Boston Tea Party.